Speaking of blackness and color, uh, he is my brother from another mother, Mondale Robinson. He is head of the Black Male Voter Project. And he was the first person who told me months ago that the state of Georgia was going to go blue. And it was so early on Mondale, I really wasn't, I didn't, I was like, man, you're talking a lot of game here, bro. Like, how, how did you know months ago that Georgia was going to go blue? Some old black woman told me. No, I'm just, <laughs> no, I'm just joking, brother. Um, you know, man, I I I, I turn I tune out uh, national polls and 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 rather just listen to voters and what they're telling us. And um, I think uh, Black Male Voter Project being able to talk to so many black men across the state of Georgia gave us a a preview that most people didn't have, especially since they don't prioritize black men in their political work. Mm, mm. And so in that work, in in what you did, like we saw. I mean, since 1992, right? It's been 30 years or, or more than 30 right. years, right? right? We have not seen, or coming up on 30 years, we have not seen the state of Georgia go blue since Bill Clinton did the stunt in front of Stone Mountain, right? So let's let's talk about it, right? The last time we turned the state of Florida, uh, state of Georgia blue, it was on the back of white supremacy. Let's just be real about it. We turned the state of Georgia blue. Your efforts, Stacey Abrams' effort, New Georgia Projects turned the state of Georgia blue, talking to black folks. Tell us about your yeah. work. Yeah, man. So we we actually threw traditional campaigning out the window because we know it serves two purposes: one, to maintain the status quo, and also to reelect incumbents. Mm -hmm. Talking to black people or people of color two months before an election with the proverbial church fan or fried chicken is not a way to increase the electorate. So what Please we do is that. we start, you know, a year out having conversations about what's important to black men, um, not. Us talking to them, but just listening. So the first part of our program is called Brothers Be Voting, where we just sit down and listen to black men with no cameras, no white people, and no women. And we have real conversations with brothers who don't normally participate in electoral politics. And what we found out was there were no apolitical black men, not just in Georgia, but in this country. Um, there are no apathetic black men. There are tons of black men that harbor uh, a level of uh, uh, antipathy. Uh, for electoral politics, and part of it is not politics in general. It's for the way that it's presented to them. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that every election is the most important or every candidate is your savior does not work. However, when you engage the same population of, of, of people on their issues that are important to them, they turn out just like everybody else. Meaning, if you invest in black men like you do conservative leaning white women, mm -hmm. you have a higher elected and turning Georgia blue wouldn't be something that happened once every 30 years. It'll yeah. happen every election cycle. Now, Mondale, I'm going to pass this to to Jake and to Ida so that they can ask you some questions. But you do know, bro, tomorrow on the morning show, I'm going to be roasting you for putting on your very best code switch voice. Like you sound so <laughs> professional right now, bro. It's like I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a first on the Young Turks. So we got He's a professional on the show. Oh man, I, I I love it. But but like wait, wait, when we really on our show when we talk, man. <laughs> It is with an authenticity that uh, that you brought to the Black Male Voter Project, right? Indeed, and that's why I'm, I'm I'm picking with you, right? We we joke about code switching, but you you talk to the people in a yeah. language that they understand, and it's not just the vernacular. It is you talk in the language of policy. Black yeah. folks care about policy. Indeed, and I've been, I know we're gonna switch to someone else asking a question, but I do wanna to respond to that idea that you know it's important that the, the, the program is the rhythm and not just the beats and music, it's the rhythm of black men lived experience. Meaning we don't talk about politics that sound like Harvard or Yale. I'm not saying that there are no black men that go there, but that's not the majority of black men. Especially right. if you consider that nearly half of the black men in Georgia and in this country that are already registered to vote have not voted in five consecutive of federal wow. Elections. So wow. what we were able to do is reach brothers who don't vote, um, brothers who are uh, what people call gang members um, or street mm. tribes or what we call them, brothers who are uh, drug dealers or, or participate in underground economy, and tell them what's in it for them in this election cycle. Mm. And and talking about those issues, i.e., uh, adding trades back to school, uh, including coding or ending cash bail or uh, fighting for qualified immunity. Not language that brothers use, but they definitely uh, articulate. You know Absolutely. Um, so talking about those issues, we're able to, in the primary, create 144,000 black men who did not vote for Barack Obama in the primary in 2008, did not vote for him in 2012, or no other federal election in between this year and those years. And these brothers were already on the ballot. So we turned these brothers out and then 104,000 of them came back out. Uh, in the general election. So wow. we know that talking about these issues uh, and not talking about candidates or centering parties and party loyalty will get you more voters. We mm. definitely know that, we saw it. 
So Mondale, that's actually amazing. Uh, and so I, I want to know everything about that. Uh, number one, um, how do we know specifically that it was the uh, 104,000 number? Because uh, if that's, I mean, I want to replicate that everywhere, right? Mm, indeed. And, indeed. And, and number two, what were the issues that drove them most? Yes. Yeah, so I think it was the three issues that I just named. Those are the only issues we talked about with black men. And these weren't our issues. We didn't say this is not the top three issues for Mundell. People always think, oh, those are your issues. I never say what's most important to me, right? Most important to me is everybody having a passport, being able to see the world. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that's not the issue that moved black men. The way we know that is because we had more than 4,000 conversations in focus group status with no cameras, like I said, no white people, no women, just black men. And we oversampled for brothers who didn't participate in electoral politics. And the reason we know this is what moved them is because these are people who hadn't been targeted and were not being targeted by any other group in this way. We we literally had over 11 touches with each one of these brothers, meaning we talked to them in multimodal fashions at their doors, on their phones, texting and calling and through their social media platform. So, um, and then we also have a different ideal on advertising. We don't run ads, you'll never see an ad on TV from Black Male Voter Project. We go to the nightclub. We have club ambassadors. So wherever black men are, we're having conversations. We figure out how to figure the DJ and the manager into our program in a way that seems real and natural and not like it's forced. And we have yeah. a candidate in the space forcing their ideas on these brothers. Mm. That went to Magic City? <laughs> well, we didn't. We didn't go to. We didn't go to Magic City. We brought Magic City to politics because if yeah. you look at the uh, get your booty to the ad poll, that those talking points came from Black Male Voter Project. We wrote those talking points, and that ad was one of the most viewed political ads of this cycle, and it was most effective. I think over 12 million views. Now, now, just for the just just for the sake of of everything, now the ad was produced. Get your booty to the poll is the one that was kind of controversial, but yeah. it was uh, with strippers. But it was produced by a black woman in the area, Absolutely. and she consulted with Black Male Voter Project for the language. And the language in that commercial was some of the best language, in my opinion, in terms of conveying the importance, the the convenience, and the methodology of voting. Absolutely, and and, and it's it's important that we say that those are dancers at Magic City. So that's why I mean, yeah, I Magic yeah. City. So I'd upset you, yeah. No, they didn't go, but they brought it to them. <laughs> And don't scoff at those dancers because they make a lot more money than some of y'all who have degrees. Period. Uh, so I, I come from, I come from Miami. I grew up in Miami. Uh, Uncle Luke is one of my mentors who I in the community that I grew up in. He was the DJ at my school. He taught me uh, financial literacy at a very young age and always <laughs> taught me things about the law. And I hold him with high regard and respect. And he never tried to direct me to a stripper pole. But. <laughs> I think that it's important uh, to what you said. I talked about that today. Uh, when it comes to us, and when I say us, I'm talking about uh, black and brown people, melanated people, those that come from the 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 continent and 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 the east, is the language that it is so important that we maintain a language. Malcolm X talked about speaking to the people so mm -hmm. that a man on the street can understand what you're saying. And I think that that was very important this election that we started using the vernacular of the average person because the average person in our communities are, are not the doctors and the lawyers. Those are the exceptions. And so how um, when you approach this, you 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 seem so, um, you know, you're so, uh, uh, I, I don't know what the word is. You fancy, you real fancy <laughs> right now talking about what you're doing. Oh, you and, fancy, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, he, he's fancy with it. Mm. But I just think that um, I, I, want to, I want you to express how important it is for us to speak to the people that we tend to overlook and look down on who are the people that we realize during this pandemic are the ones who keep us together and alive and show up for us. And, um, and we don't, we, the custodians and the, and the maids and the people who are who are the 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 bulk of the people in our communities who actually save their money and own homes and and continuously we overlook them and we keep mm. talking to this very minor group of people who are the ones who got out and made through made it through how do we how do we continue to have this language and to keep using this so that we can keep motivating our people to show up 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, a few things. First of all, thanks for that question. The first thing is, uh, we got we to gotta make our side of the aisle, the Democratic Party, uh, stop spending $1.3 billion on white men consultants. Uh, th- those guys fail epically and they always fail up. It, it's unbelievable to me the fact that you know you, you win elections 60%, Joe Biden became the candidate because 60% of black people in the South made it so, right? Mm. And 60% of that money did not go to black people, 20% of that money didn't. Less than 5% went to people of color of 1.3 billion spent this election cycle. And we know while the party will reap all the rewards of black and brown voters turning out, they they don't reward black voters, especially for political thought and strategy. So what we did was we separated ourselves from the party. And the way we speak this language is we not, we're not owned by the party. We're not an auxiliary of the party. We're an outside group and we pride ourselves in that. We are of the community. And I think that being of the community gives me bona fides that some folk can't get if they grew up in the party and they depend on the party structure to eat. That's their nipple. So I don't. I don't, I don't feel that way, I am not that way. And I think speaking the language is so new uh, to folk uh, outside of our communities that it still sounds strange to them and they're afraid of it. Um, but yeah. for us, it's it's home. It's natural for me to speak this way. When I see a black man, it's yo what's good and it, and it carries over in our program as well. Another right. thing I would say is we, we are obligated to acknowledge the lessons learned from Maslow hierarchy of needs that tells us folk that don't have their basic needs met can't think about things like physiological relationships, meaning having healthy relationships or think about things that are self actualization. And the way we present voting to people that are living even on the margins, it too, it seems like self-actualization. So we re- we reimagine what it looks like using some behavior psychology tactics to increase brothers' participation and pique their interest in politics and letting them know that no election will be the end all be all, but all elections are tools to our, liber- our liberation. Mm, mm. Let me let me throw this let me throw this at you real quick, Mundell, because because I think a lot of people misunderstand it. What you do is not simply speaking into black men. By code switching, no, it's far more nuanced than that. Um, and and I'm not trying to give a shameless plug to what we do every single morning, but what mm-hmm. we do every single morning is a level of communication about the issues with the demand of truth. Right? Every time you and I and Marcus speak, there's a demand of absolute truth because mm-hmm. you know between the three of us, we're not going to tolerate any BS. Mm-hmm. That's also a part of what you're doing. You're telling these black men truth, and they're responding and they're showing up to the polls. Yeah, I mean, it goes back to that level of antipathy. Like black men hate politics the way it's presented in this country, mainly because because after white men, black men were the first demographic to get the right to vote according to the 15th Amendment. But anybody that believed the 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote are living in a they're living in a world that's fanciful, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm trying to be polite on y'all's show because I would say <laughs> something else. But <laughs> let, but let's be honest. Let's be honest. I mean, it, all that did the 15th Amendment was make black men the first guinea pig for voter suppression, and it never mm. stopped. So black men live in, if you think about it, if politics are the cure for things that are ailing communities, it seemed like black men who make up the lowest rung of most markers in society would be the most voting demographic. But we also know something that's true that people never say. There's no such thing as a low information voter or a sporadic voter. There's a such thing as low investment voter. And because the Democratic Party is so gladly take credit for super voters, meaning people who vote every election, but will never take credit for low investment voters, we call these people sporadic and we blame them for not turning out when in actuality, it's the party's fault because they invest in their conservative leaning white cousins trying to convince them a demographic that they've never won um, over their base, which are black men. Thanks for watching The Young Turks, really appreciate it. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. You'll get to interact with us more. There's live chat emojis, badges, you've got emojis of me, Anna, John, JR. So those are super fun, but you also get Playback of our exclusive member only shows and specials right after they air. So all that, all you gotta do is click that join button right underneath the video. Thank you.